Cool. Uh, so this this week is all about casting. So we're going to be casting. Uh, just sort of like mold making was last week. You really need that in order to do what we're doing today. You have to have some sort of a mold. We're just going to extend it and talk more about the materials that you might cast that you might make. That's the main goal for today. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is this is the list that we had prepared. And Julia, at any time, you definitely know more about all of these than I do. <laughs> Except for concrete. Except for maybe concrete. But um, there's lots of other ones that need lots more talking. So <laughs> feel free to anytime you've got something to inject, let's let's talk about it. Let's make sure that we get all of these ideas out here in the world and uh, we can we can have a good time. So right. we're gonna go. This is the list. Okay. Um, so as per usual, we're going to start with kind of just a little bit of the definitions to avoid any confusion terminology. Um, and just like molds, casting is one of those hands-on kind of things. Uh, you can talk about it all you want, but until you actually start getting messy, it's not going to sink in. Um, yep. And to reiterate something that I went through last week, when you're trying, when you're using materials that you're not familiar with, test, 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 do little tests in different configurations because every situation is different. Like that is one thing that I have learned over the years. There is no, you know, exact science to it, uh, like in the sense of um, being able to assume each project is going to get you the same result if you're using the same process, because there's just so many variables involved with like, you know, the shape and size and orientation of the things you're doing. So little tests can make it a much bigger chance of like total complete success. So, all right. So defining molding and casting. Um, so last week we went over the molds. Mold is the, the form that you use. Casting is the item that comes out of it. It's the, the copy of the thing you made a mold of, um, which, and, and that original, that original thing that you are making a mold of is referred to um, as the original, as the master, or as the pattern most of the time. Like if you go to a foundry, they'll ask you for your pattern. And what they mean is it's, you know, what is the thing you're trying to copy? So. Um, as you can see here, we have a, a plethora of different things um, ranging from uh, some very cool hot poured metal there um, to what looks like might be a, like a resin uh, um, piece. The, like yeah, resin piece. lungs. Those look like yeah, lungs yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, re I really like them. The other is that I think is important is the dental. The, yeah. It's probably a, a retainer that's really more of a mold to fit your teeth. It's like mm -hmm. as though your teeth were the cast, but those molding and casting feels like it's used all over the place in dentistry. Yeah, it's kind of the thing that most people come in contact with, and that's alginate, which is the same stuff that some of you guys have been uh, experimenting with in the studio there. Um, I think I even, yeah, I always ask my dentist for my teeth when I leave. So I, I I have I have several of these things and you can ask them to take them home, but that's the same um it's the same stuff made of algae. So yeah. um I don't know. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Because some of you have had some hands-on experience this week. I don't know if anything came up during the course of it. Good. No? Okay. Um so we can move forward, I think. Um yeah. Mold the release. <laughs> mold release is definitely something I, I think, especially for this week, for everybody who was together, almost everybody did like the alginate and plaster and alginate seems magical in that it almost doesn't need mold release because it's just so wet. Yes. All the time. Yeah, but. it doesn't really stick to anything with stuff like alginate, the thing and, and some like silicones that are used specifically for casting body parts. The thing that you run into isn't so much that it's adhering to you, it's that it's creating like a mechanical lock around your body hair, which can be a real uncomfortable experience when you go to take it off. So using yeah. mold release just makes it a little less, um, less like going to a salon, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. 
That's fair. All right. But mold release itself is nice in that it's straightforward. We have these examples that we, I think some of these we looked at a, a little bit. There's a few of these slides that definitely have gotten recycled. But in this case, I really like these images as just ways to see that it's the separation layer. Yeah, and I mean, it's like the simplest concept is like what happens if you try to make cupcakes and you don't grease the pan or use a paper cup. It's it's really the same thing with, you know, when you're making a mold. Um, and a lot of times it is just a very thin release agent, like we have dedicated mold release, um, but you can use a lot of different things depending on your, um, depending on like the materials you're using, you, you know, up to and including, you know, Pam, like the spray, the, the, the spray oil that you use in the kitchen um, and good old Vaseline, you can really never go wrong with that. Um, and again, to reiterate, if you are using a spray release, be really aware of what's around that is going to get overspray because that stuff will keep things from adhering, which means if you do it in the wood shop, you can completely mess up somebody's ability to finish their project because nothing will stick to it. So just, you know, FYI. Um, and let's see, I think we can keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So next, next up is plaster, mm -hmm. which is the thing that we were literally just playing with and what, <laughs> what James's hands that, that fell off. <laughs> so we've got pl plenty. Uh, Julia, you definitely have things to say about plaster. Do you mind if I nerd out on the chemistry a little bit first? Go for it. I always okay. Yes. Yeah. So the, the calcium sulfate stuff that is up there in the top right. So that like it's hard to visualize atoms or molecules or those sorts of things. Um, but in this case, that's not a terrible depiction for what's going on there. You've got these weird sort of almost like playing dice kind of shapes that are the sulfate. You've got these little marbles that are the calcium, and then you have water that goes in uh, and can be stabilized. When you get it in its powder form, I think it's just fully anhydrous, like there's almost no water in it. And then you add a bunch of water and it gives it sort of a slick layer where they can stabilize. But then that water sort of reacts and gets absorbed in in a more integrated way and then it locks in place. So you get this uh, really nice setting chemical reaction that happens. It's not like it dries, it's a chemical set. Uh, and so it doesn't shrink very far. It's also uh, a material that does a good job of of being pretty workable in in that like it'll flow really nicely it's not very thick when it's mixed up with water and so that's been really helpful for everybody who's played around with this stuff this week is that it conforms to molds really well yes it is like the classic casting medium because uh it's cheap it's easy to work with um and it's readily available I, one of the things I really love about plaster is it's a perfect example of a material influencing culture. Um, just as a side note, if you've ever seen pictures of um, like French design work and things from um, you know the, the time when the like the Louis were in power and everything, and you know if you've ever seen like pictures of the inside of Versailles and things like that, it's this insanely ornate um you know little curly cues and details and all sorts of crazy things happening the reason it's called plaster of paris is because paris is is basically on top of a huge gypsum deposit and the availability of the material allowed them to do all those things which i think is really cool um and you know whereas that did not happen in other places where it was not really readily available and interesting things about plaster are um, it, it sets up very quickly. It is, as Corey said, it's a chemical reaction. So it cures, it doesn't dry, which is why it heats up. Like when you, when you pour it, you will get to the point where you can feel it, it gets quite warm. Um, and then if you take a cured, like a, a block of plaster that has been mixed with water and then you heat it up again, once I believe it goes over 120 degrees, it starts turning back into a powder. So um, you can kind of, you know, it's it's typically not practical on a, you know, from a day-to-day -day, um, standpoint to do that kind of a thing, um, but it is extremely versatile. 
And if you are making molds out of plaster, which is one thing that you can do, it is a factor that you have to consider when you're drying it and storing it. Do not let them get too hot because it'll literally start, I believe um, it starts to, the, once the heat removes the water from the chemical bonds, um, yeah. it, it just reverts. Um, for purposes of um, like what we're doing at Make Haven, there are basically two types we've got. One is hydrocal and one is Puritan. And the Puritan is a very basic kind of like good all-purpose plaster. The hydrocal is just a denser, stronger version to use for art castings and things like that. That's really the only difference. Because, like it's the same basic idea. It's just one is a lot kind of finer and harder. Um, you can do a lot with it. As you can see in the room there, we stuck a, a bowl or like a piece of wood into <laughs> a cast and got a hand, a hand popsicle there, a handsicle. <laughs> so you could do that kind of thing where you can embed things into it. Um, like I, I, I actually legitimately think this is how store mannequins were made at a certain point, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, and you can use it as a coating as well. Um, it is basically like it, it behaves a lot like a fine cement. Excuse me one second. Yeah, one of the, the I could go on and on about the chemistry, but basically <laughs> it's, it's that you've got all of this water that builds in and reacts and it gets locked into those, um, uh, not quite a crystalline structure, but it, it's a really, it's a fascinating material in its own right, like as a material, but the value that it adds here is great. Yeah. And one of the classic ways that uh, plaster is used, especially when you're with um, people who are learning to um, mold and cast, is you can make a very inexpensive mold called a waste mold using plaster. Um, and if you've, if you've made, say, a clay model, this is what students would do. They would make a single use mold out of plaster, which is basically a two part mold that comes apart um, it destroys the original in the process and you have to kind of dig out because, you know, any little undercuts because the plaster is rigid, you know, like the ear will get stuck in, in the mold and you have to clean it out. But once you put it together, you can cast into it and then the, the mold is actually chipped off the surface, which is why it's called a waste mold. You only get one of them, but it's a, it's a very economical way to get a permanent copy of something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to have. So if you've used oil clay or something else that isn't archival, it's a really good way to um, not spend a ton of money and time with rubber and all that other stuff and get yourself a nice copy of your piece. So um, that's one of like those kind of classic uses for it aside from using it um, in a, uh, in a casting capacity. And then the other thing is that it's used very heavily in ceramics for making molds for ceramic slip casting, which is what uh, the way that a lot of the, um, you know, the day-to-day -day ceramic items that you'll see around, that's how that stuff is made. Um, so it's just a great material <laughs> all around. And I can go on forever about plaster and the way that Corey can go on about cement. So we will just yeah. continue on. <laughs> I, no, I, I think it's great. I'm especially looking at this bird in the bottom right that like yeah. the, the fact that it takes in filler material as nicely as concrete does is also yeah. great. Any, yeah. any of these materials that has a chemical set rather than like a dry where it contracts a little, they take fillers really well. And so you, if you wanted to put in pebbles or other things that would give you sort of a different surface look, it's a neat thing to consider. You could even put glitter in your plaster, I'm sure, if you wanted yeah, to be- Yeah, and you can also add fibers um, or use it with, with um, burlap to strengthen it because it doesn't have much um, or really any tensile strength. It's all compressive strength. But if you add fiber, it becomes very, very strong, um, right. which is- and it's another really great way, you know, that's part of the mold making process. And if you're making like a hollow cast, you do, you line it with um, plaster soaked bandages or strips of um, burlap and you have a very strong cast. Yeah, that, which is, which is sort of a reach back to the composite materials where you wanted to have something in tension and compression, something to handle each of those forces, which we're going to, we'll talk about a little bit more later on. The exact as well. same idea. Yeah, totally. 
Okay, and so now we're going to do the same thing, um, and and I'll talk a lot about cement and concrete. Go for and, it. Yeah, these cement is the glue in concrete. I just want to say so that we get it right. Uh, I grew up using them interchangeably, but have been corrected many times. That cement is a powdery material that you that is inside of concrete. Concrete has just got four ingredients. Cement is one of them. It's it is a part of that. But basically, it's an important part of understanding. Yeah, that's a good civil engineering joke. But they, you know, every time you use them interchangeably, an engineer's calculator runs out of battery somewhere. So cruel. Yeah, but this, I mean, this is, here's the person who said it. This is their YouTube channel um, where they go on and on about it. This is a great video. If you want to learn all about concrete, and cement, you can watch this. There's the here's the four ingredients: sand, cement, water, and gravel. And basically, it's just a mix of those things. It's it there's a part of me that wants to say it's a lot like plaster. The cement is a lot like plaster, um, except that it's almost intended to have all of these things put together so that you have this mixture of of things at different size to sort of take up the space. The gravel and the sand take up volume. And the cement is what really acts as the glue to hold it together. And the water is the catalyst, is the piece that makes it react. Um, and in the same way that it gets hot, this concrete also gets warm, just like plaster would get warm as it sets. And it can be a long, slow curing process, but it's definitely a cure. It's not a, it doesn't dry out on you because you can pour and have it solidify underwater. So concrete can be poured for like fully underwater things. If you're building the base to a bridge, that can all be, sometimes they'll evacuate the water away when they do that, but it's also possible to have it, if you can contain it while underwater, you can have it set underwater. Typically it's stronger if it's dry when it, a little, only slightly wet. Um, so there's many of the things that you're gonna buy if you go to a big box store and buy a bag of cement, or you can buy bags of concrete, you buy bags of concrete, you're going to get all of these things in a predefined mix ratio. If you're talking to a civil engineer, they're gonna have an entire field called mix design where they're fine tuning the amount of sand and gravel and cement so that they have just what they need for the particular application. Um, and so you can you can do all sorts of things that go along with that. This video, which I will, I will not play, that's the person whose joke it was. They go on and on about the process of doing it and how how you have them cure underwater and above water. Like there's all sorts of different examples. They do a whole series of tests of mixing and talking about it and then crush tests where you can see sort of how this works. So if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, it's a great video to watch. Uh, and you can see that there's tons more just about concrete and how it works on this channel. So it's definitely worth watching if you're feeling like you can't fall asleep and you want to watch some video that maybe will help. Uh, this one on concrete is delightful, but it may all, you know, depends on what your perspective is. It could also help you. And, and also the art nerd in me has to mention that um, another kind of way that like a, a single material can influence a whole culture is the Romans yeah. in concrete. They built everything ah. on concrete and it's still around. It's crazy. Yeah, so it is. It's, it's an incredible material in in the exact same way that plaster is um but just for like large massive scales and so it is it is an ancient technology and very in very much a way that feels like it like it's hyperbolic a little bit but then you you think about it and they there were definitely romans engineering mix design so that they would get the right recipe to build the parthenon or the Colosseum or all those things and so it's just four ingredients, but if you get it just right, you can build things that will last for millennia, which is wild. Um, and so one of the, there's a lot of different pieces and features that come with building something that's going to last like that, uh, like the Colosseum or the the arch that is, that I should know the name, Arch de Triomphe. Yeah, de Triomphe. Yep. <laughs> uh, in Paris, those, those different large structures, part of the reason why they can last is that they are so big. Uh, those are not reinforced with rebar like we do now. When you build a skyscraper, like the, it looks like the Empire State Building over there on the right, or you build a parking deck like the one below it, those are almost entirely always 
it reinforced with rebar or some sort of metal is the common modern way. You can even see sort of the, the rebar structure across the bottom there. Those have metal inside, which is great. It really helps the tensile strength of the concrete, um, but it rusts. And so when the rust forms, it expands. There's a whole host of things that go along with that. The ancient Romans got around it by just not including anything. They would mix those four ingredients and that was it. Um, there's a little, a little bit of a factor is that they had the like, there's a special type of volcano cement that's there, but that's a very small effect. It's not like they had magical, better cement than us. Uh, we can we can design things that are much, much more advanced than theirs, but it is a material that's been around for a long time and can be used in a ton of different ways. I'm a big fan of the concrete countertops, like down over here. I had those in my old house. We're going to talk about that a fair amount, just to, because it's an interesting use of this material. One of the big things about concrete and and cement in general and how how we use concrete is that there are many, many additives for concrete. And if it depends on how you get caught in the algorithm. But if you find yourself in the concrete section of YouTube, it is a very big section of YouTube that doesn't feel like it should be, right? Like it's it's sort of a, people. many people just ignore it all the time. Uh, we're walking around on it in Make Haven. It's the floor, it's what the floor is made of. But it's one of those materials that has many, many, many different versions that you can play around with. Um, and so there's different things that you can add to concrete. Those four ingredients can have many modern additions. So you can add a plasticizer, which is a material that will lower the viscosity. If you follow the instructions, probably most of us have bought a bag because you were setting a post in a yard somewhere and you, you cut it open in a wheelbarrow, you put it, you put in a hose and you start mixing it around. And it's just like enough to make sure that the post doesn't fall over. And you don't think about it too much. Um, but if you follow the instructions, they're very specific about the amount of water. And if you do mix at exactly that ratio, you get a, a chunky peanut butter consistency. But most people like when they're pouring concrete, they don't want it to pour at that consistency. They just want to add more water. Uh, however, that's not that will weaken your concrete. A better strategy is to use a material called a plasticizer that basically will make it flow like like uh, not like honey. Honey, honey would be thicker than the plasticized concrete, maybe like a noodle soup. Like there's definitely still some lumpy parts, but it will flow fairly easily in some pieces. It's really helpful if you're trying to make a concrete that is going to hit every nook and cranny of a mold. Last year, Lila 3D printed a mold uh, that she, she had bought from a designer online and 3D printed it and then use plasticizer with some concrete in order to make it very, very um, flowable, uh, very low viscosity. And so then it was able to flow into all of the features and details of this 3D printed mold. So it's a really cool material. If not those, and if you look at the cylinders that that person made in their video, it will dramatically change what the surface finish looks like if you add plasticizer, because it'll fill an entire surface instead of leaving pockets and pits. Um, and it's great. Works really well. Another thing to do is. Oh, I was oh. going to mention that um, that flowability is going to determine the level of detail you're able to capture. Yes. Um, because your mold will give you a perfect copy as long as you're able to get into all of the detail of the mold. If, if you got chunky, chunky material, it's going to flow as much as it can, but it won't get everywhere. And so that's one thing with, with um, cement and plaster is they have that fine consistency that allows for detail. Yes. And so getting, getting it so that it's got all of that fine detail flowed into the right places makes plasticizer feel very valuable. The nice thing is that it's not very expensive. Uh, you get uh, a couple pounds of it when you buy it online and you need a few grams in order to make a, a wheelbarrow's worth of cement, concrete into something that will flow easily. So you're not talking about a large amount of it. You buy one bag and you're gonna be set for life probably. Um, it, and so for that, it's nice that it's relatively cheap and it's, it's very usable. Um, and so that's to hit all the little details. When you start to talk about big scale concrete, um, 
and how you might reinforce or strengthen it. This is another common thing where you might need to do something is that you can put just plain old rebar. It's very cheap. It's just like a, a stick of metal that you're going to put in. Uh, and metal, it turns out, is really good at avoiding at fighting against being stretched. And concrete basically is not good at that at all. And so if you put rebar in, it's got all those little ridges on it so that it will grab the concrete. And if there's any sort of a pull, the rebar will will fight against that. It will it will be what works against a pull on the concrete. And you can imagine that when a car drives across the bridge, you've got a complicated set of things that happen. And the rebar is necessary to have so that you don't get the intermittent pull on the cement of the bridge from car driving across to, to really pull anything apart. You want, your bridge either has to have enormous amounts of cement, concrete, concrete mixed in. I still mix them, I mix up the words. You need enormous amounts of concrete uh, or you can put in rebar and it will reinforce it quite a bit. Coated rebar will avoid rusting a little longer. There's metal meshes that you can buy uh, that work pretty well. There's all sorts of different ways that you can reinforce concrete with metal inclusions. And metal works nicely because it's so good against tension. If you want smaller reinforcement, you, there's fiberglass segments. They even sell now because it's become more popular. They sell bags of concrete with fiberglass pre-mixed in. So when you mix them up, it's already got it in there. If you're making a concrete countertop, like if you want to make a, a pizza oven for your backyard, you may want to have fiberglass segments in there to reinforce between whatever my uh, metal reinforcements you use. But often you may want to spray on the first coat without having any fiberglass in it so that your top coat doesn't have any fiberglass. You're not going to look at fiberglass in it, but it'll be there just under the surface doing some reinforcing. Also, I'm pretty sure in the lending library, we have a cement, a concrete spray gun. Huh. Uh, so it, I'm pretty sure we do. Because I remember seeing it and being surprised about it back there. But it's got a big, it's like a giant paint sprayer. It's got a big hopper on the top. Weird. And you just hold it up and then spray. And then it sprays into all the features of the mold. So it's really, if you wanted to make a, a concrete countertop, you could totally do it. Um, and that first spray layer is hard. Often it's a tool that you need to like really go to some effort to get and rent and then get a compressor that'll work with it. But it, it seems as though we might have all the things that you need. So that's it's actually how um, habitats and theme parks, uh, you know, like zoos and theme parks, they use basically a concrete cannon to build yeah. all of their um, rock work. It's kind of interesting. They just fire it <laughs> like at... Uh, like an understructure. Uh, it's the same concept. The magic yeah. of and or cement. It's it's really like as, as far as materials goes, it's fascinating. There's, I mean, there's some downsides. Environmentally, it is, I think, 8% of humanity's CO2 <laughs> comes from curing concrete. It's not like it's without consequences, but it's a it's an interesting material. There are people working on like low carbon concrete. Um, but when you think about concrete and its reinforcements, the, the Q Bridge or the Pearl Harbor Bridge, which I thought it was its official name is the Pearl Harbor Bridge, <laughs> but it's the Q. I was corrected last year. Um, it has this structure that really balances concrete's strength and compression and metal strength and tension. And so you've got the large concrete pillars that are there and massive and, and there to withstand a lot of weight. The bridge deck is concrete uh, over some metal. So it's got a metal backer, but then those cables are really there to do the pulling so that when a car drives across, it's pressing down on the concrete of the bridge, but those cables are in tension, sort of taking all the pulling force from the weight of the bridge that's got the added cars on it and delivering it back to that big pillar and necessarily it goes up because it needs to be delivering that weight downwards onto the onto that pillar. It's a fascinating, if you really wanted to nerd out on building bridges, there's a ton of cool things to think about here, but you get all of these forces that come into play together so that the concrete basically needs to always be in compression and the, the metal members can always be in tension. And then you can build a bridge with the least amount of material possible. It would totally be a workable if you just build a giant bridge out of massive amounts of concrete but now you're talking about massive amounts of material you need to move it's very expensive it could last for a thousand years like the ancient romans did 
but then you've got to invest a lot more. Hoover Dam. Yeah, but then you yeah, then you've built things like the Hoover Dam that do that will last for generations. Um, but it's but not all the time do you need that. Even the Hoover Dam was definitely engineered to be the least amount of material that it could be. Yeah. And still, you know, work. Still work. Um, if you're working with concrete, another thing that you might want to do, especially if you're putting it into a kitchen or in some sort of a, an environment where you're going to look at it regularly, you might want to seal it so that it looks nice on the surface, but doesn't absorb water. It's, it's a porous material, so water passes through it normally, but you can put things on its surface so that water beads up. If you're going to do a concrete countertop in a kitchen, this is an absolute must. You need to put something that's hydrophobic across the surface so that water will be repelled. It'll beat up and it'll sit on it. If this is something that you're going to, like for that concrete countertop, I would have needed to do it annually. So most kitchen countertops, except the really cheap ones uh, and the really, really expensive ones, they need some sort of an upkeep. If you have a wooden countertop, you probably need to apply an oil or some sort of a finish annually. If you have granite, you probably need to put stuff on it to keep it nice. Uh, the coriander and then the very, very cheap stuff that's just got a plastic coating. Those two are magical and don't need anything, but concrete needs a water sealer. Um, otherwise it'll, it'll all soak through and it'll dry out eventually just like it, it soaks through and it doesn't look good when, while it's still wet. Um, color additives are neat. So you can definitely color your concrete. If you wanted to have green concrete countertops, you could do it. A lot of people like to color it black or you can, there are at the big box stores, you can buy white concrete now where it's like default white so that it's ready to take a color really nicely. It's usually a little more expensive. You know, they can't mix in any type of rock or any type of sand. They have to be particular about all those pieces. Um, but if you buy white concrete, you can get some cool effects well, either by having it be white itself or by mixing in weird colors and getting a cool, a cool look. And then you can also add inclusions. You can add in glass, like broken up glass. You can add in uh, glitter if you want. You could add in all sorts of different stuff. And it doesn't necessarily look good at, at first, especially if your surface layer, if you lay down a surface layer, but we do have diamond grinders for the angle grinders back there. And if you use a diamond, a diamond grinder on there, so like a diamond tipped grinding wheel, you can polish the surface down. So you're just going to eat away at the top layer of stone and then all of this glass becomes exposed and you get a really neat, almost granite looking kind of surface. So there's some cool options for if you wanted to make it look really cool, you can play around with all of those if you're really trying to get an aesthetic out of the material that you're casting. Uh, this, is, this would also be true in plaster for the inclusions. Uh, Julia, does it take color really nicely? I assume plaster does. Plaster, um, typically, you know, truthfully, I have not done a ton of experimenting with it. Usually plaster ends up being painted or stained after the fact, mm -hmm. but there's got to be ways to do it. I just, you know, it's not something I've done personally. Yeah. So there's always a way. You just yeah. have to be careful that whatever you're putting into it um, doesn't either interfere with the chemical reaction or turn out to be a different color than you think. Like once I tried, um, I tried using some uh, some so strong tint, the urethane tint in plaster and the black turned out sort of like an eggplant. It was like purple. Oh. So it wasn't, and it cured and it like it did cure, but in kind of like a weird way, it was just not what I was expecting. So test, test, test. <laughs> Yeah, no, and we and that was what we found when we did the uh, Wacom Wacom stand was that like the red dye that I bought that was specifically for resin, you poured it in and it turned orange, <laughs> just like flat, completely orange. Yeah. It was um, yeah, and so all of those things, making little tests, are really important for any of these additives, and that feels like it's slowing down the process. But if you really care about what your end result is, it's worth it's worth doing a little test just to see it. Another thing is that if you're trying to do uh, multi-part things and adding a color or inclusions, you're going to need to be fastidious about documenting and uh, making sure that they're the same amount or try and mix them all in the same batch if you can and then pour them all at the same time. There's lots of different things that can go wrong there, but if I can imagine if you wanted blue concrete for some reason and then you want to make another, another blue thing to put in the same room with it, you're going to 
if you don't mix them at the same time, you're going to definitely be able to tell. Uh, or you very carefully measure out the amount relative to the amount of concrete that you've got, trying to match it perfectly could be tricky. If you could do it all in one batch, it would be better. Um, but those are all sorts of additives that you can that you can play with if you're working with concrete. But now, next up is epoxy. Ah, uh, magical epoxy. It is. Uh, yeah, they, um, so uh, epoxy, like epoxy is resin, but not all resins are epoxies. There are other types of resins like urethanes that you'll come across. Um, and frequently people will use them interchangeably. Um, but just keep in mind that if you buy something that says resin on it, it's not necessarily an epoxy resin. Okay, there are differences. So um, epoxy is frequently used for um, lamination and composites and uh, things like finishing boats and making um, you know motorcycle parts and things like that all of those things that we were looking at with the composite section because it's really great for what's known as layups where you're um, using a binder, in this case, the epoxy, and some sort of fabric or mat and laying out layers of it um, for strength. You can also use it for encapsulation, as you can see um, with the bar top there. That's one of those tried and true um, bar fixture kind of a things um, where either tables or the bar itself will have things embedded in epoxy. Uh, because it will flow out and create a very nice level surface. Um, and then it's also used for encapsulating objects um, to preserve them. Also for jewelry and um, wood turning. The uh, Wood turning is a very cool thing that I'm hoping we'll be able to get going soon where you can um, cast an epoxy blank or a wood and epoxy blank and then make a really, really great um, turned piece on the lathe. So um, things to keep in mind, um, epoxy has a, a nice long set time usually. The way that it like it kind of, um, it, it cures at a very predictable progressive rate that like on the chart would look just sort of like an angle. Um, with urethanes, it's, so, so it goes from, with epoxy, it goes from like, not cured at all, the slightly more cured to slightly more cured until at the end of its cure time, you know, 12 hours later or something, it's fully hard. With the urethane, it's like, it's not cured, it's not cured, it's not cured, suddenly it's cured. It's a very different type of reaction. Um, and so it's used for things where you need longer working time, um, like working on a boat, for instance. Yep. Um, yeah, were you gonna say something, Corey? No, uh, you're you're nailing it. I was thinking about the turning on a lathe. The the thing that makes it workable for that is that it's epoxy has got basically the same machinability properties as a hardwood, as many of the hardwoods. So when you're turning something on a lathe, you're not going to feel a giant difference in the epoxy and the wood. Um, that's not true if you were to cast it with like pine, pine is much softer. Uh, you would definitely notice it there, but it, it would feel like a maple or a cherry for hardness it's level. Like a nice kind of a hardwood consistency. Um, and it's an interesting way, you know, if you have some very kind of irregular gnarly piece of wood, that's really cool, but you can't really make anything out of it embedding it in a block of epoxy and then turning it on the lathe lets you, you know, kind of make something out of that cool piece of wood that preserves it. Um, and yeah. it, epoxies are actually used as reinforcing um, in situations like um, preservation where say a piece of an historic building is starting to decay because it's made of wood. If it's impregnated with epoxy, it will reinforce it and halt the degradation. So that's something that is actually used in a lot of um, like restorative types of work. Um, and you can actually buy kits of it, you know, fix your windowsill if you don't want to replace it. Um, it's, it's very cool stuff and it will soak in. I did a, um, a test on a cast. It's actually Ruby's hand at the casting station 
where I just painted epoxy onto that plaster because it was a plaster cast. It soaked right in. So it's, it's now um, one with the plaster went into the porous, um, the surface because it's porous. And it's now reinforced and significantly stronger than it was by itself, which is very, very cool and an interesting way um, to make something that might or might not <laughs> survive much, much stronger. Um, yeah, and I think it's also for your soaking in, it's, and I, this is a bit of a stretch, but it's like the, the bodies exhibits that come through every so often where it's like parts of people that you can go see in a museum. They're, they're definitely soaked a uh, resin into those bodies so that yep. you can see all of those features and pieces. That's exactly how they do it. Um, the first person yeah. to do that was some crazy German scientist, I think in maybe the 1800s or earlier. Yeah. With it's some type simply, of resin. And those, yeah. those are still, I think he did like a full horse. <laughs> um, those things are still on display because it's uh it, it just lasts, uh, it is a polymer. Uh, one, yeah. one thing I do wanna mention here, because if you guys look, see the encapsulated um, flower there in the sort of lower left quadrant of the slide, um, when you are encapsulating things, you are always going to encounter air entrapment and bubbles and things like that. Um, you want to make sure that there is not air in there because where there is air, there is the possibility for decay. When you are encapsulating something that has organic matter, it is entirely possible to take a beautiful rose, put it in epoxy, have it not be completely dried out so there's moisture, have air trapped, and you're basically just creating kind of like a rose-shaped fungus terrarium. <laughs> so yeah. just yeah. if you're encapsulating, keep that in mind. Um, yeah. Last year, Kate did goldfish crackers, right? Uh, um, and I would love to see what those goldfish crackers look like now. Have you seen a guy on Reddit who epoxy casts a hot dog on a bun with no. like relish and mustard and ketchup? And it like I have heard of that. This was years ago. And he oh, yeah. regular updates. Like, here's the hot dog two years later. Yeah, and it probably looks completely <laughs> fine. Perfect. Well, yeah. If you do it right, it's fine. If you Bizarre. do it wrong, it's not. <laughs> like that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. it's it's really it's an amazing material and like that canoe is a wet layup where it's the same thing you're so, you're sort of protecting the wood yeah but boy yeah. epoxy covers the gamut for like usefulness in many many different ways to embed to coach to create composites it is i need to go look at that hot dog now yeah. <laughs> and, like. uh, and and actually amber is a resin yep the hardened resin from the sap of the tree. So it, you know, th these things have been around for a long, long time. Yeah, absolutely. We wouldn't have Jurassic Park. Yeah, right. the the um, internet provides many examples of what you could do with it. Uh, it's a, because it's often crystal clear, it's a really cool material to work with. And there's tons of cool examples of like how you'd make an ocean table that looks like the ocean. And then you pour clear epoxy over the top of it and it, and it totally disappears. People figure out di different interesting tricks to like make it look like there's a candle that's on fire mm -hmm. or how to do, uh, I'm a big fan of, and they're not depicted here, but like epoxy keycaps for a mechanical keyboard are yep. really cool. There's all sorts of fun things that you can do to really, really nerd out on epoxy. Um, and like the stone coat floors in garages where they're like little pebbles coated in epoxy, it's totally a thing where you have a, a semi-porous material that can let water all run to a drain inside of your garage. The things that I, I just want you to stress with you guys, when you if you decide to do an epoxy project, you will need to deal with bubbles and air yeah. and trap. And um, when you're, for instance, uh, pouring a river table, you're almost invariably going up against some sort of um, randomly shaped, edge grain of a few slab of wood because that's part of the, the allure of that. But what that means is a bunch of little fibers kind of sticking out into the liquid material. It's just purpose built to trap air, trap little bubbles. So you yeah. have to have, in, in that case, you would use a torch 
to pop all the bubbles, which causes them to rise to the surface and pop. Um, so with some things, it would mean casting it under pressure. With some things, it would mean degassing it in the vacuum chamber, like we talked about last week. So yeah. as long as you have a plan before you pour, you're good to go. Just keep in mind, bubbles are going to happen. You just need to find a way to deal with them for your particular yeah. application. So. To your point on river tables, one of the things I've seen people do is like, before you do the big like river pour, you coat the edges that are going to be the most problematic in a brushed on layer of epoxy so that that is where the bubbles live. And then they can't like go into the main epoxy where they'd really be visible. You know, they, yeah. they're sort of just trapped up against the wood and don't look like anything. And you can still hit that with a blowtorch. Yeah. It sounds, oh. And frequently you, you want to do things like if you have a large surface area and it's fairly thick, you may want to do it in multiple pores, like different stages. Yeah. Um, it sounds are, like. Yeah, go, oh. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, you're good. Arvia, is, Arvia has an encapsulated rose. They can be, it sounds like she, she loves it, that they can be really cool. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, there's, you get really like just gorgeous results. Um, and it's really cool to be able to have something that is that well-preserved for that long, you know, um, it means a lot. And, uh, you know, Again, testing is great, but also you want to choose a material for the size and thickness that you need. And if you're not sure, you can always call the company that makes it to ask them what they recommend. Um, there's a lot of different materials out there. And most of the time there are people that are super knowledgeable about it and they'll tell you exactly what to do and what to buy. <laughs> so um, don't ever be afraid to do that. It's great. Like, I'm, I'm sure the smooth on helpline is extremely tired of me at this point, but. <laughs> I have All a right. question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, how on earth do you pour epoxy around something like a flower? How do you do it so it doesn't move the petals? Um, well, you may need, generally starting in a very, um, it, you don't pour directly onto it. You fix the flower in position. So it's just in space, like within the, um, the mold surround or the, mm -hmm. you know, within the mold. And then you go from a low point and let it rise and very slowly. And mm -hmm. it will go into all of the little mm -hmm. nooks and crannies and whatnot. And then if you're able to also cast it under pressure, that is very, very helpful in getting bubbles out and making sure that they're not visible. There are encapsulation resins tend to be very, very, very thin, like water thin, which helps with the, the air entrapment. But as long as you go very slowly and let it like seek its level from the bottom up rather than dumping it on top of the flower and letting it go down, mm -hmm. then it'll cause the air to kind of come up as the, the level rises. It's very also, good. Um, yeah, I'm looking at this one here and I'm thinking about the mold that that might have been cast in. I wonder if it was made completely upside down from how it's shown now. Uh, the yeah, the flower, like the, that the mold would have, it looks like it's a dome, that the dome, oh, uh, Arby is saying she has. Yeah, mine was, a, a, was, was just that I poured it upside down. It was mm -hmm. a flat, like the top of it. So it was a, a sphere, a, a sphere with like a sphere, goodness, however you say the word, um, with like a flat top. So you put the, I put the flour into the mold and basically poured it upside down. I think that's what you're about to say, Corey. And it had like, yeah, I dried the flour for weeks um, to make sure it was completely dry. I hung, I hung them, hung them upside down. Um, Something like down. A, a, maybe, maybe not these, but like a half circle, yeah. a half your mold yeah that's how it was it was a little bit rounder yeah probably something silicone if you get a chance can you arvia can you post a picture of it i'm sure yeah to see it. i'd love to see how you did it yeah it definitely has bubbles in it because i didn't mm -hmm. have the pressure but um i think i have the mold somewhere too i'll try to dig it up but i have the um actual flower i'll find it well not found it i know where it is <laughs> i'll post it that's super cool. cool. Oh yeah. Look at this. I feel like you could definitely make molds 
for your, depending on if the temperature is going to work out, you can get molds out of thermoplastic on the vacuum former mm -hmm. for your resins pretty easily. Yeah, so, absolutely. you know, yeah, that'd so be fun. If you put this in like the vacuum uh, device we have, because I have some, uh, some, some more roses that I want to do. So will the vacuum system we have get the bubbles out? Is that what you all mean by like? Um, it'll take all the, the air out of the resin before you pour it. Um, and then if you're That's careful with the pouring, because uh, mixing introduces air, there's no way to avoid that. So there are bubbles forming in your material as you're mixing the two parts, because epoxy is going to be a two part, a part A and a part B. It's the resin and the catalyst. Um, so during the mixing process, bubbles will form. If you vacuum, if you, if you vacuum degas it in the vacuum chamber, what that does is it brings all the air that gets introduced into the material out. So then you can pour it without all those all you know bubbles already there. Then when you're pouring, you cannot create more bubbles by just being careful and pouring from the bottom up. Um, and it's it's a pretty effective technique. Like you don't need to um, you don't need to worry about uh, even pressure casting it. Sometimes, if you've got a very very thin resin, you won't see very many bubbles um, at all using that way of doing it. And so it, this, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh, but if you could do it in a pre if it fits in a pressure pot, my like gut is to put it in a pressure pot, perhaps yeah. instead. Yeah. Um, and it's it's atmospheric pressure, not like physical pressure in the same way. So it's not like it's squashing your rose. It's just affecting the material. Okay, cool. I might try that because my mold was really small and I just cut the head of the rose off. I'll show y'all in during show and tell. Yeah, sounds great. Yep. Cool. Uh, next up, silicone is our next material. Is. So you can cast in flexible materials, just like you can cast in rigid materials. Um, and uh, it's a really kind of fun, like if you see, let's see, the third row down closest to the text there, that looks like a silicone, like plaster and silicone together. One of those a cast, one of them's the mold, but you can actually make a rigid plaster cast and then make silicone cast or a rigid plaster mold and make silicone casts out of it because only one of the two things needs to be flexible. It's either the thing coming out of the mold or the mold itself. Um, and that's really nice because if you're making something that's squishy, uh, plaster, super cheap, super easy, super fast, great option for molding. Um, and uh, silicones also are pretty effective. Like you can, you can manipulate the properties to get different viscosities, um, like the the gray silicone you see there, like that's the sort of consistency you're used to in your home, where you're using it as a caulking agent. Um, but you can make added, you can put additives into something and make the silicone or into the the silicone and make it a thicker type that's able to hold the surface. So if you need to apply it and have it not run off, say, of like a, a wall or something like that, you, you're able to do that, which is really cool. Um, not all materials will, will allow you to, but silicone will. Um, and it is great, as Corey has here, for insulation and um, absorbing vibrations, things like that. And you can, um, you can do all sorts of creative things with it, but it also is just like a really nice utilitarian kind of medium. It's also got great heat resistance, which is why you'll see it a lot of like oven mitts be made out of it, which is is cool. Yes, yeah, so it's the international yeah. sign for oven mitt. Yep. Uh, and like trivets, things like that. I, you know, you can you can put a hot pot on a piece of silicone, no problem. It won't care. Um, and there are lots and lots of different tints you can get to make colors. Um, so it's just, it's, it's super fun, super versatile, um, and has a lot of really, um, like helpful properties, especially with like day-to-day -day objects. It's not just for molding. You can also make yeah. casts. Yeah. It's really, it's a fantastic, it's fun to play with. It's easy to use. 
Um, it's no more complicated to mix up than a than a resin, but it it's got all of the squishiness that you might want and lots of other good properties. Mm -hmm. Plastics. Yeah, plastics cover. This is another one of those videos that's worth watching. There's a brief history of plastic. Humanity is going to have a complicated, uh, you know, complicated relationship with plastic over a long time. The first time we invented it was to make bowling or not bowling balls, pool pool balls, like you know, billiard balls, and um, that was so that we didn't have to get ivory, which has got its own whole host of problems. But then it's now it's used for everything all the time. Basically, all of the anything you've ever bought that's cheap and out of a durable material was probably plastic. It was very likely injection molded plastic, uh, which is fascinating in and of itself. We're going to just skip right on past this. It's a TED Ed. If you haven't seen any of these, they're great. Um, but plastics in general come in a whole bunch of different varieties. Um, and it, Julia, stop me anytime. But the right. most, yeah, the most common, most reusable one that we're going to interact with is HDPE, high density polyethylene. It's what milk jugs are made out of. You can reheat it and reform it many, many times. There's lots of other things that are that. The number system on the bottom of the on the bottom of plastic things in general, we can recycle one and two. Everything above that is kind of not recyclable. Uh, especially six and seven, they're really like too complicated to put into any recycling chain. But um, one and two are really good at being able to be heated and reformed. And so they fit into the thermoplastics camp, but uh, we can deal with these here. There's like a plastic shredder and there's all sorts of different things that you can do to injection mold that back. So like the plastic water bottle that you're holding right there, it should totally have the number on the bottom somewhere. For what it is. Another thing is that those bottles are often the cap is a different plastic than the bottle. Okay. So like the bottle might be recyclable, but the cap might not be. It has the symbol, but it doesn't have a number. Oh, it, no, it does. Number one. Number one. Yeah. P-E-T-E. -E. Uh, yeah. P-E-T-E. -E. Yeah. That P-E-T-E -E is another one that I should know the name of, but I do not. Uh, but it's one of the other two that's pretty recyclable. Um, in general, don't try and build your own cookware. But it's, yeah. it's interesting. There's probably, you know, in a thousand years, there will be a layer of dirt that has plastic in it. When humanity invented plastic, and then maybe one day we'll sort of give it up. And it won't be in there anymore because we've realized like it's, it doesn't break down. And it, and it will totally be there for a very long time. Because the thing that makes plastic useful is that it forms from a liquid and turns into a solid. That's got useful properties. And then it's very durable. The problem is, is that it's very, very durable. And so it doesn't break down over a thousand years. Some of them, some of them break down quickly. Some of them, but many of them are, are going to be here a lot longer than we really thought they were. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot to think about with this, but um, you can injection mold here. We have all the stuff for it and it's a really cool process. There's a, I'll send a link to an injection molding video. That's really cool. If you wanted to learn how that works, how Legos get made, or I think it was in the last set of slides, the injection molding one. But pewter is our our last material. Uh, Julie, did you have anything to add to this? I feel like I just talked the whole time. Oh, no, no. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the very exciting things about molding and casting is that we're developing more and more ways to be more efficient and less wasteful. Yeah. Um, but, you know, keep in mind, you're still creating plastic waste. And so um, being mindful of that, I, I think is important and trying yeah. to, to keep it to a minimum uh, with your materials. It's um, tough. Yeah, you know, it is, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, so that's, that is all. Yep. Uh, and then like, like we were saying, our last material and Lisa, knows certainly more than I do. Lisa and Julia could probably go on and, and be much more informative. But pewter, this is the last, our last one. Excellent. Um, pewter is cool in that it melts at a very low temperature. Um, so you can literally, you know, kind of do it on a stovetop. And I've known, I've known sculptors that do that. They have just like a little dedicated 
stove and just melted it in a saucepan and poured it into their molds. Um, yeah, and we have a little induction, like a very small induction heating pot um, at the casting station that you can use. The one thing that is very important to remember is that it is still quite hot and not all um, mold materials are going to accept that. Like if you were to put it into plaster, it would either disintegrate or explode or both, depending. If you put it into a silicone rubber that isn't rated for that level of heat, because they do have specifications and can be used for certain things, um, then you're going to probably just wreck the mold or you're not going to get the result that you want. Um, and whenever you're casting anything that has um, a, a temperature, yeah, there's the little, there's our little, our little seashell there. Um, anything that, you, that has sort of um, temperature related changes <laughs> during the course of the casting. In this case, when metal gets cools, it freezes in place. Um, you have to also warm your mold before adding the, um, the metal, the pewter, what have you. Um, otherwise, it's not going to be able to flow into all of the detail. Like that's a fr frequently, it's a pretty common problem with casting um, hot metal in that, you know, if you have something that has fingers, the, 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 um, the model might, or the, the metal may get in there and cool down at the palm so it can't flow into all the little details. And, and so you'll end up with like a, a hand that has, you know, it's missing digits or something like that. Um, so that's kind of like the one thing that's a little unique to certain materials if they're heat sensitive. Um, you can, with the uh, silicone molds, you can actually put them in the microwave to warm them up. Um, and with, uh, with pewter, I think that if you're using an appropriate mold, you heat it um, ahead of time. And there is a very specific type of rubber I know that Smooth On makes just for this purpose. Um, you're going to get really nice castings with very, very basic tools as long as you keep your metal hot and you keep your mold hot. Um, and use also, there's typically like a dusting powder that will go into the mold to help the metal flow as well. Uh, I don't know if there's anything, like I know Lisa is much more of an expert in this than than we are probably. <laughs> so if there's anything you'd like to add, um, feel free. Uh, oh yes, before um, 1970, the lead is there, so be careful. Yeah, there's not much more I can add. I mean, the casting that I did, I, I did um, a few ways. One of them <clears throat> very simply was to just take aluminum foil and crunch it up into the shape that I wanted and then pour the molten pewter in there. Yeah. So that was one way. And then, um, the other way was we'd made some sort of a rubber mold, a two-part mold, and it did have an exit hole. I can't remember. Somewhere in my house I have it. <laughs> and I probably did make the little keys so that it would fit right. Yeah. If I can uh, find it, I'll bring it. Frequently you'll end up, um, there's, there's a sort of plumbing kind of considerations to take in with, um, with mold making, but very specifically with any kind of hot pour molds, you need a way for the material to flow in and you have to have vents for air to escape. Um, and that can either be a blind vent where it doesn't actually exit to the outside of the mold. It's just sort of like a little extra pocket that the air can go in. Um, and sometimes you have full vents that will travel all the way back out to the surface of the mold. But um, you know, you got to also keep in mind, like when you're pouring something that's extremely hot, the air is going to expand as well. Like, it, you know, the heat itself is a consideration that makes everything behave differently. Um, and so venting is really critical to getting a nice cast. Um, that is a lot. I'll see if I can find some like kind of high level uh, animations or something about lost wax casting and post them in the channel so that you guys can see how that works. It's sort of that's where you're pouring bronzes and you know, other other things that are like way more complicated than anything we're gonna do. Uh, but it's it's super cool to see. Um, the other thing that actually uh, that metals are usually the other way that they're made is through sand casting, which is taking a special green sand. It's called usually called green sand, 
um, and it's a very fine and it holds shape. And you put your pattern, you impress your pattern into it and remove it. So it only can be used where there aren't undercuts, but then you just pour the molten um, metal directly into it. And it's, it's super, super cool. I think that's a very, very, very old technique. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if there, let's see, I guess maybe another fun one and nobody's going to do this here but i really love the like when they pour molten aluminum into an ant hole yeah it's oh. terrible but you get to like see what the ant hill was like i'm sure every ant in there hates it terribly uh a very short moment <laughs> very short for a very short moment but the but you get this really cool cast of the ant hills like veins and tubes so there's some really cool stuff that you get out of those. There's all sorts of interesting ways to work with molten metals, but because of the high temperatures and pewter is the most approachable of those, mm -hmm. you've got a whole bunch of different rules that you have to follow. But people do take, um, like I, I've seen videos, there's a guy that will just go down to the beach, build a fire, throw a bunch, uh, like a lot, it takes a lot uh, of soda cans, use soda cans into a pot, melt them down, and then cast things in the sand. Like, you know, you could do, they're, they're not like fine detail things, but he does it. And it's literally just making shapes in the sand and, you know, pouring it in. That's as yeah. simple as the, as the technique really is. So there's, there's many, many options out there. It just depends on how creative you want to be with them. Yep. Yeah. Aluminum is another one that like, is it seven, it's 700 something that it starts to melt. Uh, so aluminum is possible to do this. At a, I think usually it's like a, a farm torch and a, and a propane or like a, a, a tank of gas, like, you know, the sort of ones yeah. that they use. It doesn't need to be that crazy hot. So it's pretty it's pr like they're, they're interestingly useful and so getting the right materials to make it work would be fun yeah uh julie do you know if we have any green sand here like at make haven in the back i don't believe so but that would be some like i i've seen um i've seen people bring it in but i think it belonged it was like you know it belonged to the individual members but it's easily something we could get a hold of yeah so. that makes sense it would be fun if we're interested we can order that and try it and it would have a special application in the jewelry section that we're building. So yeah, that actually makes a ton. We probably should get some just. Uh oh. Did Corey freeze for anyone else? Yep, oh, he did. Okay. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it would be fun to play with. My internet is probably a little suspect. But it's some greens would be good. If you do green sand, you also need like a special kind of a can to press it into. Not really, yeah. as far as no. I understand it. Just kind of like any sort of frame that isn't going to right. accidentally catch on fire or melt if you drip. Yeah, that's what I mean, okay. a frame. Well, and as long as it's, you know, if it's a big enough area of green sand, because I think it's fairly reusable, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. It is. So like, if you just have a big area where there's lots of space for it to go, you know, sandbox. like, yeah, a sandbox, really a sandbox, uh, I think it'd be fine, especially if you have like a, a little lower area where you have your thing that's sort of in a hill in the middle, and then it goes into a lower area of the sandbox before it gets back up to the wooden sides. You just, well, want, to able, you just want to be able to compress it really hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I believe... Assuming that you have that your pattern has um, draft angles that will not cause a mechanical lock when you know the the pattern is removed from the sand when you tamp it in there, I believe that you can put the green sand kind of in a in a frame that has two components and and pour two sides to the same thing all at once as long as the original pattern. Um, allows for the, you know, for it to release without destroying the imprint. You can actually find, it's kind of interesting, once you start looking for them, you see them all over the place. If you go to any kind of like an antique show or flea market or something, you frequently see wooden industrial patterns. You know, it'll be like the shape of some sort of, you know, 
pipe or manifold or something made carved in wood and what it was was used to make that impression into the sands for a sand cast um, so when they say pattern that's what they're literally talking about and it can be made out of anything as long as it can you know impress into the sand and leave that um that void for the metal to fill yeah that, that is really cool huh so many fun things uh but we should show and tell it feels like it's been a little while since we've had a good show and tell so we should see because we we've did all of our slides they don't there's no like conclusion to this particular set of slides it just stops <laughs> the computer um and so what we should do is instead show and tell a little bit about what we've been up to uh, how many fingers have broken off of our models <laughs> and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever other fun stuff we've, we've been doing. So, um, James is in the room and then there's a few people who are logged in. And so anybody who wants to go first, I, I can go, I can bring my fingers up. Yeah. You want to, you want to bring the fingers up? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'm going to cut over to here and we should, so. Let's do the camera so that people can see. It does look just like my hand. <laughs> it's just missing the fingers. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, there were a couple of little bubbles. Um, yeah, there was definitely some bubbles. Yeah. So that's what that's what that is. These bubbles here are where like air was trapped in the finger. And so it it like didn't fully form. What's and remarkable is where... that. Like is that like it really looks like all of the detail of my hand is like pretty perfect aside from the bubbles it's like absolutely like alarmingly perfect to see my hand right. on the table <laughs> your fingerprints are on there so yeah. just my eye i i actually yeah. sand when i do hand casting for clients i sand the fingerprints off because it is biometric data okay so i shouldn't like poke them on everything around the space <laughs> Hey, it's up to you, man. I'm just saying. One one thing I think is interesting is I'm in this wooden piece that's in the hand, the thinnest part of it is definitely like right along here. Yeah. And we've got a little bit of a crack. And I'm not sure what that's, that's from. Wood swelling from the water. Likely, likely true. But that's it's an interesting thing to note. I wonder if we had done the same thing out of. Uh, metal or a rock or something, you yeah. know, something else that wouldn't have swollen. Yeah. That's probably another thing that we could try and avoid over yeah. the long run. Yeah. But yeah, it came out pretty cool. It was all in all like a pretty fun process. And uh, I'm going to save all these fingers. Yeah. <laughs> we can reattach them later. Yeah. <laughs> and just in case, I think that while we're doing this, live you can change the monitor that you're looking at this is the pewter casting that i had done and i'm going to talk so that it sees me as the primary person but these are the pewter casts of the and is it out of focus it's totally out of focus focus mm -hmm. it so uh, just so you guys can see um the the difference in texture is very obvious there and that may be because the molds um was probably not heated when you did this yeah. but i also, tried but like it didn't it didn't help that much this this rubber is not you know graded for this use so it you know it it gave what it could yeah it did its very best it did. I, did you resin print the uh so yeah this is a th uh, the resin 3d printer for this this part that i found on thingiverse and this is like a little token from animal crossing which was very popular in the pandemic and then here's the like one of the casts. This one's solid all the way through. But what I regularly would find is that as soon as it made contact, it would start to solidify. So like I wouldn't even necessarily get to fill the whole thing. And it was already it was already solid, you know, like and I think that as soon as it made contact, any little vapor turned into a bubble pocket. These are the two that were the best of the castings. But I'd love to do it in green sand and melt both of these down and get one good one. Yeah. Because it's it's pewter is surprisingly heavy as a material. It's more dense than steel, I think, by a substantial amount. I think it's seven grams per milliliter, and steel is five. 
So like substantially more dense. So when you pick it up, it feels oddly heavy. Yeah. Uh, which is which is actually kind of fun. It would make for great paperweights. Yeah. So uh, something to mention, like if you are doing like most metal castings are made to be an even mm. thickness. Ah. Um, have variations. Uh, there's just a massive difference, like because of the expansion of the metal when it's hot. That little divot, if you flip the other one over, yeah, um, the fact that it's dished, it could have been completely flat when it was molten. I, but, but you will get that kind of an effect, even if this wasn't, that's the, still the same kind of effect. Like if you have a piece that's thick in the middle and thin around the edges, the edges will freeze and then the middle will take a while to, um, to, to cool down, but it will, it'll actually compress and shrink kind of irregularly. So um, molds of that are intended to be cast in metal uh, tend to have kind of like an even wall. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. And this one, I do know, cause I was there, it, it was dish-like when I cast it. So <laughs> it wasn't this, I mean, that this would be a very pronounced effect of that. Uh -huh. Um, for as small as this thing is, but it it was dish shaped when I was pouring it. Like this is what you get. Yeah, yeah. It was. It's a very opinionated mold. The one that I had. They want to be okay. Ready. All right. Uh, Norm or Lisa or Arvia, what you guys have been up to? Uh, I can. Um, I can. Uh, if I can share my screen, I'll just show something quick. I think hopefully you can. Is yes. it showing? Yes. Yeah, there we go. So um, and this didn't really work, but I'm, it's a process I'm working on and just to show what I was doing. I, I got a kind of a big, uh, I, what I want to try to do is relief carving. And so this is a segment of a much bigger uh, bunch of trees. And um, so I had to learn on Fusion 360 how to cut it down to a, uh, a, a, a thing that I would try to do a relief carving on. Uh, which is, you know, like for me, it was just a lot of non kind of obvious stuff like to, to, to cut it, you have to create a construction plane and then for whatever reason use the combine tool like you're combining something but you aren't really you're cutting it I mean you're combining the, 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 the plane which acts like a knife and it cuts through so I ended up with a, you know, something that I kind of like to, to do. Uh, managed to get it onto the onto vcarve uh, i couldn't i couldn't really position it well just directly in vcarve i used fusion 360 to get it going then got it into vcarve uh exported it to shapeoko which was great because of all the work Corey and vincent did um and um then of course the choice is what kind of tool and material and uh, you know i'm just learning how to do this so i i, I got a piece of plywood, although it would be better to do it obviously with hardwood. And I used an eighth inch uh, end mill, whereas it probably should be, uh, you know, a, um, a rounded uh, top and maybe a 16th inch, not sure. Um, and I also, and I did a roughing toolpath also, but I, I, I'm still learning how to figure out what it does and what it doesn't do. All it did here was cut, uh, the channel around the the workpiece. I didn't need to use that at all. I'd be quicker to cut it with a bandsaw. Um, and the eighth inch um, end mill, um, you know, did did some pocketing, okay, but you know what it's what it produced. And you can see kind of the tree shapes, the, the raised parts of the tree shapes. With a Dremel, I could actually probably do more work clear, cleaning that out. But in point of fact, what I'd probably do is use a better piece of wood and see if I could find a better and smaller um, um, uh, rounded end mill to do more detail work. But anyway, that's what I was up to. It didn't, you know, produce anything beautiful, but it's a learning experience. That That is actually fantastic steps forward. Um, I think... That getting V carved to work the way you want, doing the it looked like that was a roughing tool path, and then you want to do a finished tool oh, path. No, actually, the, no, no. To tell you the truth, that was uh, uh, that was a uh, 
that was the finished tool path. I, I the, uh, the roughing tool path turned out to do nothing but cut the border. I thought it might cut some of the, you know, the the, the deeper pockets. Uh, yeah. Uh, and what I learned really is that I when I did the preview, uh, I, it goes by fast and you can't figure out what's what. I, I really need to to run them one at a time. Um, so that I, I, if I had known that it was just cutting, because most of the time, it didn't take a long time, but most of the time it took to run the tool paths was the roughing tool path to cut the useless uh, oblong around it. Uh, I should have just eliminated that. Uh, what was left there was the finished tool path, but because it's, you know, it's, it's plywood that tears out and because it's uh, just a, a, a simple end mill and eighth, although an eighth inch, pretty small, um, it, it comes out looking kind of rough. That's why I say with uh, smaller tools, I, I could probably use a Dremel to 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 look at the original pattern and do some work on it. But but the the more exact way to do it would be, I think, to use a sixteenth inch rounded bit. Uh, I would use the same tool path. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think you're right. The smaller the bit, the more detail you're going to get. Um, it's incredible to see that come into fruition the other the like easy cheater way to do it is to just make it bigger and then your small your eighth inch bit you know if it's twice as big your eighth inch bit will be equally good to a 16th inch bit yeah that's true um so if you wanted to just try it for the sake of trying it you could do that and oh, yeah. see that's how that goes that's that's how i was that's what i was learning to do with fusion 360 the, the actual piece that i got the stl file was a very large panel so oh, I, yeah. you know so I, I learning how to cut it down so that you can do a blow up version of it was in fact part of what you know the project was for me it wasn't like obvious to me how to do that so i yeah. had to kind of, uh, work on it to figure out how to do it no that's really cool and it, and it is every every little transition is a struggle but i'm like i am so excited to see what happens when you get that I think it's going to look super good. Um, I'm very interested to see what the end result is when you get that to come out. Because it looked like just the right kind of relief map, the image that you had of those trees for you to get beautiful wood carvings. And I, I want to, you know, it would be great to be in the space. Like this is, this week I still have school, but next week I'm on spring break. If we can coordinate a time, I'd love to sit down and like try and make sure that that happens. Because it's, a really cool pattern that I think could look really great. Yeah, I'm I'm running in. I, I'm I'm not sure how much I'm, we're we're gonna try to go hiking in Peru. Uh, <laughs> I might actually uh, I might actually be away for part of the time. That that turns out to be a process in half too because we just decided to do it at the last minute. It may not work out. Thanks. Well, I I hope it does. That sounds great. Uh, good good for you. Um. I hope more, that more likely we'll end up doing it in early May if we do it. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that's great. Uh, well, you know, when you're not busy hiking, I'm game to help you with that design. It seems fun. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Lisa, Arvia, if you guys have anything hanging out, or if not, no big deal. No, I can talk. Yeah. <laughs> um. So after watching uh, Julia demonstrate how to cast her hand, <laughs> which was really interesting, um, we talked about how I might be able to cast the um, acorn tops that I had. And I, she suggested that I you know, research online and see what I could come up with. And, and so far, I have to say, the majority of the videos that I found are just awful. I mean, maybe what they're doing is good, but the people are presenting are are really like full of themselves. But anyway, um, so all as far as what I could find was they were casting, um, I couldn't capture what kind of rubber it was. So I might run it again when I can take notes. Um, they were casting resin into there. So um, it was a kind of a, a rubber, they, they took a, like a, a paper cup and mm -hmm. cut it pretty shallow that only as deep as it needed to be to fill the rubber um they took um the acorn cap and they took some hot glue and they glued the bottom of the cap to the bottom of the cup mm -hmm. 
and then poured the rubber on top. And then after it cured, they peeled the paper away and because they had glued the cap to the, and, and or an acorn could be the other thing, to the bottom of the cup, they were able to um, access like there was like a little entryway. Yeah, that's where your, your pore spout would be. Right. Uh, so they were able to pull it out of the rubber. Yeah, and, and that would be an actually really easy thing to do if you wanted to replicate that process. Yeah, so the only thing is, is as a result of that, it kind of has a flat bottom. Right. Um, mm. And then they poured resin in there and, you know, as they're casting, which is fine. I mean, I, I want to cast with all kinds of materials. So, um, you know, it makes it colorful if you add color to it. And it can have really fun. It just, this is the wrong time of year for me to get a complete acorn. You can only find the caps now, not the nuts because right. they're done. So that I'm just really um, uh, fixed on the idea at some point that I really want to do a multiple uh, acorn type things, colors and such. So um, that's as far as I could get. I couldn't find anybody cast, you know, showing me how to cast a metal, but I saw the result. People would be happy to sell you cast mm -hmm. egg horns <laughs> so I could keep looking uh, that's where I'm not quite sure where I'm heading regarding there's a couple, yeah there's a couple different um, ways that we could do it if you're going to use for instance pewter mm -hmm. um, that like that I would know how to do um, mm -hmm. we would simply need to get some of that high heat rubber that I mean I really like to do it yeah um so, you know, if you want to acquire like either smooth on or some other version, um, yeah, like all you need is the, the test size, you, you know, you need a very small quantity of it. Um, mm -hmm. And then you'd have the right type that would be able to handle the heat. And we already have, um, you said you had pewter, correct? You have oh, tons of it. Yeah. Then we've got the little, uh, the melter smelter yeah. pot. Um, and so we could figure out a way to do it. Okay. Uh, so um, if I go to smooth on, will I be able to figure out on my own the proper uh, sample rubber to get, or is there going to be all kinds um, of rubber? Yes. I uh, think it's mold max 60, if I memory serves. Five, yeah. And there's a part of me that's wondering if you got the like waste, the like waste wax, and then we used if you use your silicone mold to make one of the wax ones, and then you put that in a green sand, where like the wax melts into the sand, does that, would that work? Well, the, um, for, okay. sand, for sand, you would be, um, you would use just the acorn itself to make the imprint. You yeah. don't need to, yeah. gloss right. wax means that it would be covered in an investment material and then the wax would be burned out. So yes, you'd need a wax copy or just using the acorn itself. Um, anything that will burn out can be used if you've got the right setup. Um, oh, by the way, you were correct. Of, it is mold max 60 and I am putting the link in the chat. Thank you. Um, yeah, it looks like it's got uh heat up heat resistance up to 560 fahrenheit 294 celsius so that should be good for pewter um right. but yeah with green sand the one thing with it is you just have to find a way to um not have any kind of an undercut like that would be the the problem doing both yeah, sides I, I agree so i think rubber might be i easy agree to start with yep so I wanted to show a few examples where I did cast with pewter. I, I couldn't dig up everything, but um, so I made a box, but then this top is cast. So um, I believe if I remember correctly, cause it was so long ago, it was just cast into uh, some plaster where uh, just chipped away a surface to make a rough surface. So it would have some texture on the top and then soldered these little pieces on the back so it would have a way to seat properly in the box. So that was one thing. Another thing is this spoon was made by me making an original that didn't look a whole lot like this. It had a squiggle handle and it had a like a disc here. So after I cast it, then I had to forge it into this shape. Uh, I made lots and lots of these. 
And then what I did was when I made the perfect one of these, I then sent it out and had a rubber mold made and had them cast into sterling silver. Wow. And then this was the very first uh, pewter item I ever made. Whoa. And it started out, this handle was nothing more than a, a cast ingot. So I cast huh. the ingot maybe this big by, by this wide, by this thick. And by pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding and turning and turning, I made this very long kind of whoops, wire area here and bent it. And then uh, this, this piece is sheet that I shaped into that and then soldered this on. But this all was handle was cast into from an ingot. Wow. Um, then forged. That's really cool. So it's amazing what, what you can do with pewter. And can I ask yeah. how long it took to do that piece? Well, I had taken a class to start out with. So the class was only, if I remember, one or two afternoons. Oh. And I wasn't done. So at that point in time, I had pounded it quite long and realized it was going to become, but it wasn't a spoon. And I, I found myself somebody who could teach me the rest. <laughs> And so, I mean, all told, maybe eight hours, but that's because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it might go long. Also, once you've designed something and you want to do it again, it's going to go quicker. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Those, okay. are, those are neat projects. Yeah, I just got to figure out what I'm going to do moving forward. That's all. <laughs> any of this it's all right and arvia do you have did you find that flower and the mold oh i'm sorry i didn't even look for the mold <laughs> but oh, you're all right flower. yeah I cool this, flower. Um, hold on. this was my first thing i've ever done how to turn my camera around so this is the flower i keep it on my altar oh. I can't even, you can't really see it because it's still smushed in there and I need to sand it and stuff. I never did anything after I took out the mold. But it's a rose for my grandfather's funeral. Um, cool. I have a few, yeah. a few roses that, this, I just tried it on one before messing up the rest of them. The rest mm -hmm. of them are in like a, um, a airtight jar that I keep them in. And then I did these earrings of my grandparents too. These are cast in something, but that's okay. about it that's all i've done with really with resin um, i mean those are really cool thank yeah. you and i want and I, to i now want to like do a a flower as, yeah. as just a that we can have we can i mean i would do it again because i have again i have a few more left I, they were just really precious to me so i was like yeah i think I would, test it. I would test it on volunteer yeah. flowers first <laughs> before going yeah. Important ones, but I'm down to do it again because I did this in my house with some resin, and I feel like with the proper things, um, it would come out much nicer. But I, I love it. Um, I think I want to. I have a big wood slab that I was going to just make a regular coffee table out of, um, but I've been thinking about it. And I feel like it's affirmed now that I'm going to cut it in half and put the live edges, you know, flip them in to make the table. And I kind of want to do like a black and white like i don't know resin pour or something in the middle of it the this big piece of walnut that i have uh, cool. and then i was thinking about making a mold out of this i found this at um savers oh, shit. knocking down all my stuff i found this at savers this is beautiful bookend and i kind of want to dip it and make a, a mold out of it and cast yeah. something yeah. So, absolutely yeah those are the things I'm thinking about. That's that feels like a nice one for laying on its side and getting a two-sided mold pretty pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it would be it's basically a perfect design for that. Yeah, that'd be really dope. Could you do something with like with the pewter and a yep. two-sided mold in that? Uh oh, you mean make a pewter version of that um horse? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would say so. Um, you could also do a um, a bonded metal 
resin mm -hmm. one that would look like metal and have metal powder on the surface. Um, it would just be less, it would be lighter, basically. Oh, that would be good. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll bring that in. Like that thing in pewter would be It'd alarmingly be heavy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like uh, 30 pounds feels reasonable. Yeah. Well, okay. I One thing though, because it, it is, it, it does look like a bookend. Um, something that I do, and actually, I don't know if I have an example. I might have an example of this that I'll bring in so you guys can see what it looks like. Um, I guess like BB shot that's used in BB guns, or I don't know what I, the only time I would ever set foot in a gun store is to buy this stuff. But um, it's the, like the little pellets are used as a way to weight bases like frequently um like what i use them for is like this piece here is a bust and when it's hollow it, it's kind of top heavy by itself but if you embed the bbs in the base it makes it like much much heavier on the bottom and um you can do that like with anything like resin plaster like whatever and it like specifically puts the weight where you need it so it won't tip over on you so it looks right. like the, the horse might be a good candidate for something like that okay it's and do we have easy. like do we have like the materials to do the like half and half mold um yeah that's just rubber we have a lot we have a lot of mold max 10 right now <laughs> okay so. yeah. cool yeah i'll bring that in Okay, yeah, cool. I'm gonna try that. Thank you. No problem. This is a BB. This was cast from a BB. Oh, right yeah. There. Yeah, oh. so it's the handle on the top of this thing. Very cool. I think we actually have some at, I think there's some on the shelves with the rubber, like in a little container right now out there. Like buck, like buckshot, right? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's got like a little pointed cap for loading, I guess. So. Yeah, no, that's, oh, those are BBs. Yeah, those are yeah. copper BBs. And then there's lead buckshot that you could use. Um, any of that is is fine. My fun side note, my first job was working at a, a shotgun range. <laughs> so I'm very familiar. Also would not walk into a gun store now. But mm -hmm. the but it's, uh, yeah, it's good to know all those things well, like, when you grow up. In so the like country, the bag from the gun store. That's one of them, and the other is gun blue, which you can use for the for metal for darkening. Oh yeah, metal bluing, metal bluing compound for sure. Yeah, there's yeah, there's a, a whole you know, different strokes for different folks. The there are all sorts of cool things to do this week. I'm excited. I think that. This needs to be two weeks of molding and casting, not because it's like revelations of brand new things, like actually new stuff, but there's so many things to try in this space. And and I feel like all of the things that I've ever tried to cast, it takes multiple attempts to get it right. So yeah, and there's always there's there you you have to wait for the material too. It's not like anything's ever instantaneous. Um so you know, it just takes, it just takes a little time. It is what it is. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So that, but that, I, I feel like we did it and it's exciting to see what people are going to make this week. There's a couple of important updates to consider. One is that we have, what we're doing now this week is we're, we're going to keep going. But this is Easter weekend coming up, which may be relevant to some of you, may not. But the more important for maker things, I'm going to be leaving. This weekend, I'm going to see my sister-in-law in Nashville. And so I'll be gone from Friday to Sunday. Um, I'll be around on Thursday night. And so Sunday, I won't even be in town. But if, or well, maybe I'll be in. I need to check when my flight comes back. If I'm around and it's in the evening and I'm not like exhausted, I might come in. Um, and then next week is a wild card week. So next week on Monday, we can we can meet, but I wasn't planning on necessarily doing like a lesson, but if you wanted to come in and make something big, uh, or if you wanted to do more casting, any of those things, I'd be happy to 
work on the Gerber or work on the molding and casting stuff or any of those things. And then after this, we're gonna slide right into group projects. So we're getting very close to coming up with something interesting where we can leverage all of our different skills and strengths and things that we do to try and work like a team to make something that really integrates all of this stuff and all of our skills together to make something as, as like a team project. It's gonna be lots of fun. It's gonna be lots of weird uh, and really looking forward to it. If you have any, another thing that's worth saying is if you have any ideas for good group projects that could use multiple people's perspective or input, we'd be happy to listen. There's a, I've been sort of spitballing it with people for like what to do here. And we're thinking about something for letting people, now that that hallway is super empty, trying to think about getting something that would be approved by the landlord um, as an entry way, or like once you're past the nice clean white hallway that says make havens off to the left, you know, those sorts of things that maybe respond to a person when they walk in or, um, you know, any sort of, of display that, I'll that could be useful. Robots, like, hey. Yeah. Yeah, robots that move. Maybe they maybe they can sense that a person's there. Computer vision could see a human and like respond when there's a person facing it or something. There's a whole there's a whole host of things that we could do. Um, that one feels pretty high techy. There's also lots of other options. So I'm I'm gonna think about ideas. You should think about ideas. Um, but it would be lots of fun to try and build something that really uses our skills, and then come up with ideas from there. So that'll be something to think about over the next week or so. So it, it's almost like we have two weeks because of this week and then the wildcard week for make something big or molding and casting or anything that's into that camp. And then we'll regroup for how you build machines and mechanisms and group project stuff. So that's the, that's the game plan. And oh. I believe, um, yeah, and I, my typical hours are um, six to nine on Thursday nights, but this week and next, I could be in a little earlier if people want to, you know, just kind of do a group work session, then I am totally down for that. So, cool. and anyone else that has projects, they can kind of join in. <laughs> Regular constituents can just jump in. Yeah. If, I, if I get my hands on that uh, mold 60 max, I'll let you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Just order it from Reynolds um, Advanced Reynolds. Materials. Yep. That that link will take you to the Smooth On website. And, uh -huh. um, but Reynolds is in Boston and they ship out very quickly. So. Okay. All right, great. Thanks. No problem. All right. So it sounds like we've covered lots of things. Perhaps we should call it a night and get everybody off and making things. So have a lovely evening, everybody. Have a good evening. Have See a ya. Good <laughs> ha yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.